Hi, I'm Vanessa Perez, Council Member for District 7, and tonight we're here at a town hall to discuss ethylene oxide, which is a cancer-causing chemical that we have um, in our air right now due to emissions that are being released by uh, a factory that was, or a, um, a sterilization plant that was identified uh, through some reports that came out recently. And so we are here to ask um, to zero out the emissions of ethylene oxide in our air so that we don't have to put our community at an increased risk for cancer. We're also here to ask the EPA and the TCQ to get on the same page with their information because there's a lot of misinformation going on around right now as far as, uh, and it's confusing the public. We're also asking EPA to hold a Region 6 meeting, which they have neglected to do. And uh, we've been working with Congressman Cuellar on this issue, and he has um, gotten the EPA to agree to a public hearing to, to discuss, a Region 6 hearing to discuss this. And so we're looking for the community to unite with us. Uh, Laredo, uh, Clean Air Laredo Coalition was formed so that we can unite as a community and we can uh, do whatever is necessary to make sure that our air is healthy and safe for us to breathe now and for future generations. So we're asking the community to sign our petition for our requests and join with us and stay informed. And then once we get that EPA meeting with Congressman Cuellar, we want everybody else to come out again and bring their neighbors and make this a bigger movement so that we can get the change that we need to make sure that our community is safe. I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight. I know that everybody's tired. You've had a long day at work or school or whatever it may be. And so we thank you for joining us tonight for this important meeting. Uh, I'm Vanessa Perez, the council member for District 7. So I want to welcome you all to the Faskin Recreation Center here at District 7 in case you've never been here before. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing some of our dignitaries that are present. Um, on his way, we have Councilmember Dr. Marte Martinez from District 6, so he'll be here soon. Uh, right now, we have Councilmember Alyssa Cigarroa representing District 8, and she's here. We have the Honorable Cindy Liendo representing Precinct 4, and she's here to represent Webb County. We have uh, Mrs. Ms. Susan San Miguel representing Congressman Guaya for his office and she passed out some letters. We have Mrs. Lupita Cepeda representing uh, Tracy King, State Representative Tracy King. We have uh, Assistant, Sis Assistant City Manager Ms. Christina Hale. I saw her back there somewhere. There she is. Thank you. And we also have some city directors that are going to be, that have been assisting with this issue and that are here as well. So we have from the fire department, we have Chief Hurd. He's there. We have the health director, Dr. Richard Chamberlain here. Doctor. From environmental and solid waste director, we have Mr. John Porter here. And we have Dr. Victor Elizondo, our Laredo Health Authority. Victor Health. Oh, sorry, Dr. Victor Trevino, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Mr. Felipe Elizondo, the Webb County Code Enforcement Officer present as well. Okay, so I just want to thank everybody for being here. I know that there's a lot of concern in the community uh, with, you know, your, your, stu your children and students at our schools and things like that. We don't have all the answers for you tonight. I will just let you know that we don't. Um, this coalition was formed over the summer as reports of ethylene oxide emissions in our community started to come out from different sources. We knew that the ProPublica map was going to drop um, sometime in October. We didn't know exactly when, um, and we didn't know exactly what it was going to say, but we knew. And so we were working on it. We were trying to get as much information as we could. The Rio Grande International Study Center Trisha Cortez, director here as well, um, started you know reaching out and trying to bring people together, stakeholders, to try to figure this out. And so that's how Clean Air Laredo Coalition was formed. There's a lot of concerned citizens in that coalition, and we are here tonight to share some information with you that we know, and ask you all to join the coalition, keep up to date with um, information as we know more we would like to be able to share that with everybody 
so that we can stay informed on what's going on and work together to try to fix this problem. You know, we, we know that the ethylene oxide, the EPA recently said that it causes cancer, and so we know that it does. We just need to know how much of it's actually getting to our homes, to our schools, and that's the thing that we don't know right now because there is no monitoring. TCQ doesn't monitor, neither does the EPA, and so those are things that we are concerned about as a coalition and as a community, and those are things that we are asking you all to help us demand and push for as a community to get these other organizations, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and the Environmental Protection Agency on board, on the same page with, you, with each other because right now their data conflicts, so we need for them to get on the same page and we need for them to get on the same page with us in what we're asking them to do to protect our community. Just like we can ask them to come and check the water and things like that, we want to ask them to come and check the air and right now they don't. So. I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to um, Trisha Cortez, but I did want to note that Councilmember Dr. Marte did walk in, so he does. He is here, Councilmember Dr. Marte Martinez, representing District 6. So you've got council members here, and we're trying to make sure that the city does whatever it can to help with this problem as well. Thank you very much. Muy bienvenidos. I'm going to set my timer here. Um, I'm just here to give a general overview of what we know so far and uh, what our asks are. So next slide, please. So, uh, sorry. The, the, so so the, the, the key problem is that we discovered uh, this year that Laredo winds are at a significant risk of developing cancer from ethylene oxide, which is a cancer-causing air toxin. And a big part of the problem is that we didn't know. So many of us didn't know the science behind ethylene oxide has been changing. And five years ago, the EPA changed the rules. Um, uh, next. So five years ago in 2016, after all of these toxicological, epidemiological studies, um, they, the EPA classified it as a known uh, cancer-causing air toxin. And this was based on lab data and studies on industry workers. And it's not just the EPA that recognizes ethylene oxide as a dangerous air toxin, but other agencies as well. Next. And, and I'm, I wanted to tell y'all, the way that we found out in late spring is we started getting phone calls from investigative reporters um, asking us all of these questions we were not aware of. And then the EPA, um, our, our region is based out of, I'm sorry, our region is based out of Dallas, and so they started to approach us too. And uh, this is how we started to get involved. And once we did, we were, we were truly stunned by uh, diving deep into the EPA databases and uh, knew that um, people had to know about this and we had to address this right away. Um, so uh, the emissions are coming from a facility, one plant, it's in the Killam Industrial Park, Midwest sterilization. Um, uh, this is a chart, I don't know if y'all can see it from the back, it just shows, this is all the data from the EPA and it shows their level of emissions every year from 2005 to 2020. And uh, they've emitted close to 200,000 pounds since, uh, since 2020. We don't have 2021 20, data yet. Um, but you'll notice where it says total pounds, um, the levels at which these emissions uh, have been for Laredo in the you know, 15, 17, 14, 16,000 pounds. Um, and all of this is self-reported data by the company to the EPA. Next, and you're gonna see where we rank. Um, so Laredo is in the red. Um, there are about 110 facilities in the United States that emit ethylene oxide into the air and we rank second um, based off of the 2019 self-reported data. So it, um, interestingly, that was what we learned in 2019 and then uh, it, there's a, 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 you're gonna hear tonight from a community outside of Chicago 
that went through this also. Um, I think the, okay, thank you. And you'll see in blue, the Willowbrook, their plant, no, sorry, Max, it's okay. Their plant uh, was emitting about a third of what Laredo was emitting. It had been around longer though, and uh, they unified as a community, and uh, that plant shut down in 2019. But this is just to give you reference for the volume of emissions that Laredo is producing. Um, next. So again, we rank second in the US, and I think this bottom one, I think this is what stunned us the most. We were working with environmental scientists so there are about 15,000 facilities in the United States that report air toxic data to the EPA on all sorts of air chemicals and carcinogens too. And out of these 15,000 industrial facilities that report their data to the United States, we rank because of the, the level of toxicity that ethylene oxide possesses, we rank this is all, again, with the 2019 data, third in the country of highest cancer hazard from air pollution specifically among all of these facilities that self-report to the EPA. Next. So what is ethylene oxide? We have this environmental scientist you're going to hear from. She's going to get more into depth. But essentially, it's a class one carcinogen, which means that it is known. It is already proven to cause cancer in humans. It's colorless, odorless, highly flammable. It dissolves in water. It comes from natural gas or petroleum. And it is used in a variety of ways to either make plastics or detergents, or in our case, to sterilize medical equipment. And then the byproduct of doing that creates ethylene glycol, which then gets sold as antifreeze. Next. So one of the things, and again, the scientist, Dr. Terrell, is going to speak about this. What makes it so dangerous is that it's um, mutagenic. It starts to make changes in DNA cells, and children are especially vulnerable. And the EPA has, uh, when they came out with all of their new classifications on ethylene oxide, um, um, has stated now that ETO is 60 times more toxic to children than they previously thought and 30 times more toxic to adults. Next. And so, again, the scientist is going to talk more about this. There are uh, short-term uh, issues that can impact the body from inhalation of ethylene oxide and the longer-term exposure as well as a carcinogen. It is especially known for these types of cancers um, and other types, but um, the, the EPA science has shown that especially lymphomas in males, leukemias in children, and breast cancer in females. Next. And, and one thing to, to let you know is that it takes years of exposure um, to chemicals for cancer to manifest itself. It's not necessarily overnight. It can sometimes take decades of exposure. Um, and this is what we are trying to stop and prevent. They're entering into year 17 in Laredo, and this is when things start to happen, and this is what we're trying to stop. Um, this is the ProPublica map that uh, Council Member Bettis was referring to. It was a two-year analysis that they did, um, and they looked at billions of rows of data from the EPA. Uh, and so this is uh, where Midwest is, and, and uh, y you know, you'll, you'll see, and I'm not going to get into depth on the maps because we've got two that Martin is going to discuss, but you have to see that right around Midwest, the cancer risk is 1 in 560. Uh, this is very high. The EPA has set, um, about 20 years ago, the EPA set a target rate of what they felt was an acceptable level of cancer risk. And that risk, that level is one in one million. And this is a very stark uh, difference. Um, next. This is another map that you're going to see. This is the NADA map from the EPA. The EPA um, looks at all sorts of things uh, that can cause cancer and air pollution. And um, 
Ethylene oxide for our community is the overwhelming driver of that. These are census and, uh, tracks and zip codes um, for the native map, and you'll see that the red area, you'll see how much of Laredo is impacted um, beyond the Mines Road, and the red area just shows that, and all of these areas compare us to the rest of the country. So in this area, with this modeling data map from the EPA, it shows that uh, you are more likely, you have a higher chance of, uh, you have a higher risk of developing cancer than 95 to 100% of other Americans. Um, next. And Laredo schools are equally as impacted. Uh, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst has a study out called uh, Air Toxics at School Projects, and they look at all schools, and they've identified 95 Laredo schools, public, private, charter, college, university, and um, 10 of those schools um, and those areas rank in the top 1% of most air toxic hazardous uh, air pollutants. Um, next, and this is, if you go to this website, you will see the rankings where we rank uh, in a, a co compared to other schools in the United States. Next, and uh, this will be on our website. We've just tried to put it all onto one page where you can see your school that you're interested in, where it ranks nationally. You'll see 94 of 95 schools rank at least in the top 6%. My time is almost up here. Okay, uh, next. And uh, this is um, uh, here, Muller Elementary, and sort of the cancer risk level. Remember we talked about the EPA's target is one in a million, and uh, in the Muller area, it's one in 3,700. Next. And essentially our what, what we are uh, striving for is we want the company to install safer alternatives that do exist to zero out these emissions. Um, secondly, as the council member said, we want EPA to begin air quality monitoring around the facility and around these impacted schools and those neighborhoods. We want EPA to hold a community meeting in Laredo to figure out with us how we make this happen. Uh, and number four, we'd like to work, Dr. Trevino is going to talk about this, about a pilot study uh, to get biological markers to test uh, blood, ethylene oxide levels in the blood. Um, another uh, uh, request would be for UISD to possibly relocate Muller students uh, to other campuses um, at this time because of how susceptible children are and the levels at which they're being exposed to. And then lastly, the EPA right now, they are in the process of revising the, uh, the standards for ethylene oxide. And um, so we are hoping that they can finish this quickly and, uh, and, 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 and strengthen it as well. And that'll probably happen sometime next year. So thank you very much, council member. Thank you, Trisha, for that information. So like I said in the beginning, we don't have all the answers, but we do have some data that has been collected, and, and it does speak volumes. So now I'd like to introduce Mr. Martin Castro from the Rio Grande International Study Center, uh, Watershed Science Director. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you all very much for joining us here tonight. Uh, as Councilwoman mentioned, my name is Martin Castro. I am the Risk Watershed Science Director here at the Rio Grande International. Can you all hear me now? Yes. I apologize. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us here tonight. Uh, my name is Martin Castro. I am the Risk Watershed Science Director uh, here at the Rio Grande International Study Center. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about, just briefly, uh, the maps which we have up on display on to the right of the uh, meeting room. The first one I'll be talking about is the one in the middle, which is the EPA's National Air Toxics Assessment for Laredo, Texas. Thank you, Marilyn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, the, just briefly, the National Air Toxics Assessment uh, from the EPA 
essentially gives a snapshot of outdoor air quality with respect uh, to emissions of air toxics in our community. The National Air Toxic Assessment suggests the long-term risks to human health if air toxics remain steady over time. The National Air Toxics Assessment, the way it works, is that it estimates the cancer risks uh, from breathing air toxics over many years. The NADA data set also estimates non-cancer health effects for some pollutants, including diesel particulate matter and from other particulate matters. Essentially, the native data set calculates these air toxics at the census tract level, which you can see in the map, uh, the census tracts which are, are displayed. And it includes only outdoor uh, sources of air pollutants. It does not show risk variation for a particular area. So if you, if you look at the, at the uh, top of the map, you can see the red area, the census tracts highlighted in red are in the 95 to 100 percent uh, percentile, which essentially means that Laredo, if you are in this area, Laredo is at a uh, greater risk of developing cancer than 95 to 100 percent of the U.S. Uh, population. So, if you want to take a closer look at the map after the meeting, feel free to walk up and I can answer any questions about it. The second map that I will be discussing the second map thank you all very much that I will be discussing is the EPA's risk screening environmental indicators model for Laredo Texas uh, the EPA's or, or RESI for short the EPA's uh, risk screening environmental indicators model uh, models chemical releases from facilities that report to the EPA's toxic release inventory. The map itself represents toxicity weighted concentrations using geographic microdata, which the EPA has divided in, in, uh, in the map to grid cells that measure 810 by 810 meters in area. The toxicity concentration values in this map have been acquired by multiplying the inhalation toxicity weight for these chemicals and then summed over uh, each particular grid cell. These values can then be used as a suitable measure for comparing levels of possible impacts between different geographic areas. In this map, the resi toxicity weights per grid cell range from, range from less than 10,000 toxicity weighted pounds to over 6.4 million as you um, get closer to the source of the emissions. So again, feel free to uh, take a look, a, clo a closer look at the map after the meeting, and I will we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. At this time, I'll pass it over to Councilwoman Perez. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next speaker is um, Dr. Kimberly Terrell, she was supposed to be here with us today, but due to flights and all of that, she couldn't make it. Um, but she is here with us on Zoom, and she's going to speak to what is ethylene oxide and why is it dangerous? She's an environmental scientist who works with the impacted communities in Louisiana. Laredo is not the only city going through something like this. There are other cities and other regions, and she is in Louisiana. Thank you so much. Um, please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, but uh, like council member said, my name is Kim Terrell. Um, and I want to just tell you briefly about my background um, and, and my interest in this issue. Um, I, uh, I'm a scientist by training uh, with a background in kind of um, nitty gritty biology, cell and molecular biology. Um, I worked for several years in the biomedical research field and for about a decade studying wildlife health. Um, I have a PhD from the University of New Orleans and in 2018 I joined an environmental law organization in New Orleans and now I work very much at the intersection of science and um, legal issues, environmental issues with communities that are impacted in Louisiana. 
Um, and I think one thing that kind of makes me maybe unique is that I've actually worked with ethylene oxide in the lab. So I, you know, I wore a little detector to measure my exposure. Um, I, I used it in my research um, as a sterilant. Uh, and so I understand, you know, uh, the, the laboratory perspective and community perspective. Um, and so I want to um, also kind of uh, make the point that there are communities like yourselves fighting this, you know, across the United States and in Louisiana. Um, so these two pictures represent one community on the left that is fighting a proposed facility that would emit ethylene oxide, and another on the right that is fighting a facility uh, that's been there and recently expanded that is also a major emitter of ethylene oxide. And the community on the right recently benefited from EPA's outreach to educate them about the risks of this chemical. Um, and so before I dive into the details, I want to focus on three key messages that I, I really hope everybody takes home with them tonight. The first is that uncertainty is not a reason to ignore health risks. So in the communities that I've worked with, I see again and again people focusing on uncertainty, right? Oh, it probably causes cancer, but it, it's not 100% sure. Um, but that's no reason to dismiss those kinds of risks. Second, we've heard from EPA again and again that they stand behind their science. It's not my job or your job to defend EPA's science. It's EPA's job. And finally, there is always an alternative to everything in life. There's always an alternative. Um, and so uh, Trisha told you a little bit about ethylene oxide, um, but the reason it's so dangerous is because of the, how the molecule is shaped, uh, how it's structured. So it's a, a, it's a three member ring. And so it's a triangle, which is a very unstable shape in chemistry. And so it wants to pop open, it wants to react with things. And when it comes into contact with DNA, it attaches to, it pops open, attaches to DNA, and can cause a mutation that can lead to cancer. Um, and so ethylene oxide cannot tell the difference between bacterial DNA and human DNA, right? So that's, the reason that it is such an effective sterilizer is the same reason that it's so dangerous to people, because it directly attacks DNA. But there are a lot of other ways to sterilize something that don't use that kind of, of method, that don't use something that attacks DNA. Um, and as Trisha also mentioned, both the EPA and the World Health Organization classify ethylene oxide as a known human carcinogen. So this is not something that's unique to our country. Uh, it's an issue around the world. Um, and it's something that communities like yourselves are learning more and more about. There are a lot of risks of ethylene oxide exposure because of the way it acts, right? Because it attacks DNA, it can disrupt basically every body system, right? And so we hear a lot about the cancer risks because that is what EPA's assessment focused on. But there are other important risks to be aware of, <clears throat> excuse me, especially um, neurological risks, right? So risks to your brain and, and your nervous system. And we know that if any amount of exposure to a cancer-causing chemical is unsafe, right? If you catch your kids smoking a cigarette, you know that's not good for them. One cigarette probably will not give them lung cancer, but, you know, two packs a day for the rest of their lives very likely could. And so there's some, somewhere in the middle there where there's a threshold, right? But we know that any exposure, no matter how small, is going to increase the risk of cancer on top of all of the existing risk. And so the reason why we often focus on health risks instead of health outcomes is because health risks can be linked to a specific source. So the, the maps that Martin presented focus specifically on cancer risk from air pollution. Whereas if you measure cancer cases, it's essentially impossible to, to know for sure how many of the cancer cases in any area came from a particular source. 
Unlike outcomes, health risks are easy to track over time. Uh, if people move away, if people die, whatever the case may be, you can still track changes in health risks in a community. And most importantly, it's a proactive measure, right? So when we're talking about health risks, there's still time to avoid the health outcome. Um, and I, I really hammer home with communities that there are there are ways in our society that we manage risks, right? And that we have laws to protect people from exposing other people to risks. And so, you know, if you go out and you act irresponsibly and you drive home drunk, I guarantee you the police officer is not gonna care if you can show them evidence that you didn't actually hurt anybody. Um, and similarly, we take measures to protect ourselves from risks every day. So I get in the car, I recognize there's a very low chance that I'm gonna get in an accident on my two mile drive wherever I'm going, but I still put my seatbelt on. And the EPA has spent a lot of time and money in the last several years educating communities about the risks of living near ethylene oxide sterilizers. And if I were in your community and, and I were hearing claims, you know, that, oh, it's not a big deal, there's no risk, I would ask myself, well, why is the EPA spending all this time and money, you know, to educate other communities across the U.S.? And they've been doing this for several years, by the way. Um, so uh, a couple years ago, the EPA's Office of Inspector General, which is the, the entity that is basically the watchdog for EPA, published a report uh, kind of calling out the agency for doing ethylene oxide outreach in some places and not in other places. And so it found that the region that we're in, that, that Texas and Louisiana is in, had not done any outreach at that point. Since that time, our region has started doing outreach uh, in, in some communities. Um, and Laredo is on this list, by the way. Midwest sterilization um, is the, the second line in this table. Um, and so I also want to kind of make the point that we can't assume that a facility that protects its workers, um, that that automatically protects the community, right? Because worker safety and community safety are two totally different things. Um, and, and that's because there's different pathways of exposure, right? So these facilities release emissions through chimneys or vents into that outdoor air. And just like, you know, if I had a fireplace in my house, I'm not, my house isn't gonna fill up with smoke, hopefully, right? The smoke is gonna go out the chimney and into the neighborhood. And you might be able to smell my chimney, you know, uh, my wood fire when you're walking down the street, and, and you're gonna have, you know, a different level uh, of, of pollutants outside the structure versus inside. Um, so it's important to, to protect workers, but protecting workers does, does not automatically protect community members. And it's important also to remember, like I said earlier, that there are always, always alternatives, right? So ethylene oxide itself is an alternative method of sterilization. The most common method that uh, hospitals and, and veterinary clinics use is called autoclaving, where they use high pressure steam. But not everything can be subjected to heat or moisture, so you need alternatives. And there are several alternatives for heat sensitive items, um, and none of these by itself uh, is, is perfect, right? So whatever method you're using, there's going to be some equipment and some pathogens that are that uh, it's, it's not effective with, right? Including ethylene oxide. So, you know, this narrative that there's no alternative to ethylene oxide, that wouldn't even be safe from a medical perspective, right? Because we know that bacteria can develop resistance uh, to any form of sterilization. And we also know that ethylene oxide has risks beyond risks to the patient. Uh, if that device is not allowed to off-gas long enough, um, they can actually expose the patient to ethylene oxide. And on top of that, ethylene oxide is uh, flammable and explosive. So there's risks inherent um, in using that chemical uh, in, in a facility. Um, and then uh, it's important to know also that the FDA is partnering with industry, with sterilization companies to develop even more alternatives to ethylene oxide sterilization. 
Um, because if you think about it, there's a lot of things that need to be sterilized, including living tissue that's used for transplants. So, you know, companies have a lot, a lot of incentive in developing uh, alternative ways uh, to sterilize different materials. Um, and importantly, just because something's safe, or, or I'm sorry, just because something's natural doesn't mean it's safe. There are so many examples of things that our bodies produce that we should not breathe, right? Stomach acid, carbon monoxide, chlorine, ammonia, all of these things are produced in our bodies, but you should absolutely not breathe them. So, you know, again, um, keep in mind that, you know, breathing ethylene oxide is well, well known to have negative health effects. Um, and EPA has stated, you know, over and over that they stand behind their ethylene oxide risk value. It was developed based on extensive peer review and the best available science. Um, and, and scientists have debunked TCEQ's risk assessment, um, finding serious scientific problems with it. So again, I want to leave you with three messages. Um, you know, if, if this was my community and this sterilized and the sterilizer, you know, were near my house, I would absolutely be concerned about the health risks. Um, and I would be concerned because EPA has told me to be concerned and has said that it stands behind uh, that message. And again, there is always an alternative to anything that we do in science and medicine. But, and thank you all, I appreciate the opportunity um, to share my perspective with you and we'll be happy to answer questions later. emphasize uh, Dr. Terrell uh, took the time out of her busy life to help us form the Clean Air Laredo Coalition and been working with us for months on this issue to educate us and to put all of this into perspective. And so I'd like to give her another round of applause, please. She, she doesn't have to be here. And uh, next we have our Laredo Public Health Authority, Dr. Victor Trevino, and he's going to discuss public health impacts of this carcinogen. Thank you, and uh, for inviting me to this town hall meeting. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Victor Trevino, Health Authority for the City of Laredo, and uh, I'm born and raised in Laredo, a product of the public schools, and I have uh, 38 years of uh, practice in medicine, and I've been practicing medicine in Laredo here for 36 years, and have worked with the health department for about 36 years also. I'm the current uh, medical director of the health department and the health authority for the city of Laredo. So uh, as I act as the state officer in this capacity, and I was tasked with informing and recommending and protecting the health and safety of our community when it deals with this topic. Now, I have to disclose that the regulation of emissions in Texas is regulated by the TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, as has been stated. And uh, overall, falling into the um, uh, jurisdiction of uh, the uh, EPA. So the overall jurisdiction is under the PEPA. So I'm here to speak on the questions involving public health impacts, which falls under the Texas Department of State Health Services and the CDC. Now currently we're dealing with some of the most important issues and challenges when it comes uh, to our community, including communicable diseases as we're, under, we're undergoing right now, water quality and emissions in our air. Now these issues are sometimes difficult to talk about, uh, they're uncomfortable, but they're especially important to our community uh, because of the fact that we're medically underserved and un underinsured and we have spoken about these issues. This means that we're limited uh, on resources uh, to treat large amount of sick people at one time because we do not have enough doctors, nurses, and ICU beds, and medical facilities. Now, there shouldn't be a dispute on certain exposures of ethylene oxide that it is harmful and, cause, and cause certain cancers. And currently, the EPA regulations are still being developed but that doesn't mean that we do not have information on the toxicity and the carcinogenicity of ethylene oxide. 
most of the human studies by the CDC uh, are evaluated only on cancer endpoints, which, which means once we have the tumors or the cancer that is developed, with inhalation being the primary exposure route. And since there is limited information outside animal studies on dermal, oral, and ocular exposure. Now we know that children are for great concern and when it comes to ethylene oxide exposure, because the risk of, expose, of exposure is greater than adults because of their developing systems. Now the Perry study that was mentioned earlier is the Political Economic Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts, which has created a risk tool that we exposed a while ago that tracks air toxics and every K-12 K to and higher education schools in the United States. And anybody, anybody can look up to any school in the country and receive a report of the industrial facilities and toxic chemicals that generate health risks in the school locations. Now, the report on each school lists population sources affecting the schools and puts the impact on a comparative context relative to, the, to all schools in the state and in our country. I am a firm believer that we should follow the science and the data. And I also believe that the surveillance programs are a common public health tool that we can use to see if there's any health impacts in our community. We do this with other illnesses in our community. This can be done either by air quality or voluntary blood tests, and that is the pilot model that we we're talking about a while ago. Uh, these uh, programs can uh, or have been established in other communities and can shed light to questions that community that a community may uh, have, and uh, these are important things to implement. And uh, this has been uh, shared with the city council and recommendations that the city council can choose to implement a, a, as a policy if they find it appropriate. And with this, uh, this is uh, what I have to share with you. I just uh, will stand for any questions at the end, but uh, this is uh, where we are with uh, the science and the medicine. We have to understand that we have to uh, uh, understand the concept of correlation and causation. This has been expressed uh, the correlation has to uh, create a causation, and that is why we need the, the data and we need all the information uh, that we can get. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trevino, for that um, and taking care of our community as you have throughout the COVID pandemic and always. Um, next, we're going to hear the story of Willowbrook, Illinois, which is went through the same thing, that similar situation that we're going through. Uh, so I'd like to uh, introduce Ursula Tan Tanu Tanui. <laughs> I've always had trouble saying your last name, Ursula, I'm sorry. Um, so I'll turn it over to her. Hi, um, I'm gonna start screen sharing right away because um, I'm in a lot of these pictures, so you'll see my face over and over again anyway. All right. Um, is that coming through okay? Should look like a big logo. Yeah? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I want to introduce also um, one of my good friends, Joanna. Um, Joanna Klistik. Uh, so Joanna, come and say hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> good evening, Laredo. Um, uh, like I said, I'm Ursula Tanaway, and, and I'm Joanna Klistek, and we're with Stop Sterogenics in Willowbrook, Illinois. We're just outside of Chicago, about 20, 25 miles away. Uh, we're here to offer you our support and solidarity. In August 2018, our community found out that we have an ethylene oxide sterogenic in our suburban residential area. And the EPA NADA map showed that it was potentially harming our community. Sterogenics was located where those red marks are. The Willowbrook Town Hall and the police station are across the street. 
Athletic spaces for swimming and soccer and general training are all up and down this north-south street. A Target store is right next to building number two. And the Serotonics building opened um, in 1984 and expanded to a second building in 1999. The residential areas all around it were built in the 1960s. The closest public schools, those are the ones marked with um, green circles and little flags, were built in 1965, 1967, and 1981. Those big red lines, those are one mile markers to give you a sense of distance and space. Sterogenics chose a warehouse in this small light industrial park bordered by retail shopping strips and nestled in a primarily residential area. And they did so despite explicit concerns in writing about their expected emissions from our state EPA. They chose the site for their own reasons, not in consideration of the health and safety of their commercial, governmental, or residential neighbors. Until 2018, our community had no idea they were here or what emissions were in our air. In August 2018, everything changed. Is that my cue? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, there you go. Sorry. <laughs> um, so when we found out about sterogenics and um, the long-term effects of ethylene oxide exposure, we started by knocking on doors, talking to our neighbors, and listening to their stories. So we knew some things from our normal lives and conversations before. We knew our county had high breast cancer rates. Um, we knew lots of our kids used inhalers and nebulizers, including my own daughter. She had to use uh, an, an inhaler. We knew teachers at our schools had quietly talked about fertility, uh, trouble, and miscarriages for many years, including myself. But what we didn't expect was just how much of these issues were in our neighborhood. Um, the street that Sturgenics was located on is pretty short. It runs from the industrial park to a few blocks of a residential area, and it ends at the elementary school. Yes, the keyword here is elementary school. When our group talked to the people who live um, in that neighborhood, on those blocks. Every single house of longtime residents had cancer cases. In some homes, it was every family member um, had multiple cancers per person. In some, the exposure was high enough to cause neurological symptoms, brain fog, and frequent coughing fits. We knew these elements were common, but this scale was just unbelievable. It was incredible seeing just how much was out there. So we waged a public pressure campaign for over a year. We dug up some old news articles to help us understand what we were up against. Our municipalities are very close together. You can drive through three separate towns in 10 minutes and several more towns just beyond those. We engaged with all of them, but especially the closest three. We knew our mayors, our trustees, and our representatives by sight. We sure saw enough of each other that year. We worked with the local fire department, health department, county board, state representatives, state senators, the governor, and the state EPA. Some of our working relationships were a little different than others. We had some fun with our stateside uh, representatives and officials. At the state level, we found some allies and we put relentless pressure on key individuals who had the power to make meaningful changes. But we also engaged in significant debates with officials and representatives who thought our concerns were overblown. We saw chemical industry lobbyists in the committee rooms and in the Capitol building hallways. They were pushing their message 
as we pushed ours. We passed two new laws to restrict where any new sterilizer could be located, how well emissions had to be controlled, and what monitoring and accountability standards they would need to follow. The new sterilizer law was named after Matt Holler, a young dad who was the first community member who died of cancer after we found out we were being poisoned. We engaged with our congressmen and senators on the federal level, the EPA, the FDA, and a division of the CDC known as the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ATSDR. We especially got to know the Office of Air and Radiation Staff and their public outreach teams at the EPA, and also our regional contacts with the ATSDR. They helped us understand each of their roles and we provided feedback and local perspective to help clarify gaps and shortcomings. When we started, nothing was certain, and Sterigenics had a long practice and repeatedly successful misinformation campaigns ready to go. They had deep pockets and a team of industry lobbyists. We had grassroots volunteers, working parents, seniors, quiet suburban families. We came together over one thing, safe, clean air. We were relentless. We talked to everyone, we found allies, and we pressured key people who could make those meaningful changes that we needed. Our community put in hours on the phones and sent thousands of postcards. We chipped in to charter a bus to our state capitol so community members could talk to our state legislators face to face and push forward our bills. We chipped in to send small teams to DC to work with our representatives, lobby other members of Congress, and meet with EPA administrators and FDA officials. We were defending our home. We left no stone unturned. In September 2019, Sterigenics announced that because of the uncertain legislative and regulatory environment, and some trouble renewing a lease, they would not be pursuing a restart of their operations in Willowbrook. A seal order from the state had shut down their operations several months earlier. We put so much public pressure and attention on them from every angle we could think of until they finally gave up and closed. We won, and you can too. I'm not here to tell you the process was easy. We felt devastated and angry we couldn't believe what was happening. And then we got to work. We went into survival mode. Everything that could wait was set aside. We skated by at work. We lost time with our families. Our kids got lessons in civics together with us because whenever public meetings were scheduled, we were there with comments, frustrations, or just to show our support in numbers. It was never too late or too cold even standing outside for hours on a snowy February night, waiting together for the news trucks to provide interviews, putting a very public spotlight on what was happening. Ethylene oxide sterilizers have practiced their messaging for decades. They use the same techniques as tobacco and lead. Deny, deflect, confuse. They deny ethylene oxide is harmful despite international consensus that it's indeed harmful even in very small amounts. They will highlight how much less poison they put in the air today than they did last year and argue about how much poison is okay for your children to breathe every day. When they say there aren't alternatives, they mean there aren't alternatives that are as profitable as ethylene oxide. They won't mention that sterilization companies bought out alternative technologies and buried them. They deflect blame to regu regulatory agencies and play victim, saying they already comply with rules they helped write. They even confuse experts using trade group funded research papers. If, you see, if you've seen Dope Sick, it's the same idea. Industrial ethylene oxide pollution should not be in the air we breathe. There's no good way for community members to avoid ethylene oxide. There's no easy mask you can wear, or home filter you can buy to protect yourself. Your protection is your voice and your advocacy. 
to compel sterilization companies to use other methods that accomplish the same result of sterile supplies and safe products, but without the ethylene oxide that poisons communities like yours and ours. When we started, we knew nothing about ethylene oxide or air pollution laws or whose job it was to oversee all the pieces of the problem we kept unraveling. We came together and we shared our skills and knowledge to become the experts we needed to be. Our neighbors and friends pitched in what they could, time, money, knowledge, or just by showing up and showing how many of us cared about what we were breathing. We stood united and we worked with anyone who would listen. Everyone here can help. Everyone has a skill they can contribute. If you can talk to your neighbors, you can help. If you can share truthful information on social media, like the information shared tonight from Rick and Dr. Terrell, you can help. If you have some organizing or government experience, you can help. If you can plan events and handle logistics, you can help. If you can translate in writing or in speech, you can help. If you have marketing, graphic design, or communications experience, you can help. If you can read science literature or legal documents, you can help. If you can show up and be present when your presence is needed, you can help and your help is needed. Everyone breathes. This is everyone's fight to put people over profits. And with that, I'll give it back over to the team. Thank you, Ursula. As I'd like to point out as well, she has also been working with us for months and giving her time to this community selflessly. And as you can see, she is a valuable resource of information and knowledge. And I'd like for us to give her another round of applause, please. Thank you, Ursula, again. Um, so the next speaker we have is Daniel Elizondo. He's another co-founder of the Clean Air Laredo Coalition, and he's here to speak about what can we do and what our Laredo demands are. Hi, my name is Daniel Elizondo. I'm a local attorney here. I'm also an advisory board member of RISC, and I am also a co-founder of the Clean Air Laredo Coalition. I wanted to come here and talk to you about what it is that you can do in the community uh, to help. As you heard from Ursula, this is going to be a community effort to have ethylene oxide out of our air and to have clean air. So one of the first things you can do is if you have one of these little pamphlets that we handed out, at the very bottom right corner, there's a QR code that takes you to the Clean Air Laredo Coalition's website. There. You can find uh, links to inform yourself more. We have articles. We also have a, a petition that we would also like for you to sign. And you can sign up to become a volunteer and help us. Doing the, uh, you know, doing the groundwork, going out, talking to neighbors, informing other people who don't know about this issue. Um, so that's one thing you can do. The second thing, and, and arguably this may be the most important thing to do, is to reach out to your local leaders, our city council members in your district, and demand that they take this seriously because this is a grave problem and that you demand for surveillance. This is the number one thing that is being refuted and argued right now in City Hall, in City Hall and that is that, well, this is model data. We don't have hard data. And they're kind of right. This is uh, model data, but we can get real data. We can install air monitoring on the fence line of Midwest, throughout the city of Laredo, and especially at the schools that are in the top 1% of being the most toxic in the entire United States. That is something that must get done. The second thing, as Dr. Trevino had said, is that we need to initiate that blood testing pilot program so that we can get blood samples from Laredoans on a volunteer basis. And it would be even better if we could also include and demand that our council members add to an order or city agenda item that the students who are going to those schools, especially the top 32 most toxic schools in Laredo, have their blood drawn and tested independently by the CDC to determine if there's biological markers of ethylene oxide in their blood and if those biological markers indicate that there's an eth uh, elevated level of that. So those are the two most important things you can do 
there's many more to do. We can talk about um, reaching out to our uh, congressional uh, congress member, Henry Cuellar, because right now on Capitol Hill, there's a coalition of congress members who are trying to legislate and, and regulate ethylene oxide on the fe at the federal level uh, to reduce the emissions to a more reasonable amount. Uh, and we really should push Henry Cuellar and call him, email him, uh, send letters uh, to demand that he join this coalition and demand that there is zero ethylene oxide in Laredo and that the legislation that he helps write uh, in, on Capitol Hill uh, reflects that. So those are the things that we can uh, do right now and that you can do uh, to help the coalition become a part of the coalition and help get ethylene oxide out of our air. Because at the end of the day, like the coalition slogan is, ETO has got to go. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, Martin is going to come up, and he is going to uh, give us a little bit more information about what you can do on the website with that QR code. Thank you, Danny. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the front at check-in, and you may have also received copies of our agenda tonight, there is a QR code which you can scan that will direct you to the Clean Air uh, Laredo.org website. Uh, from there, you can do one of three things. You can most importantly sign our petition to the EPA. Secondly, you can volunteer to become a member. And thirdly, if you haven't already, you can check in uh, right now uh, as an attendee to this town hall meeting. So we strongly urge you to do uh, those things if you haven't, haven't already. Um, at this time, Trisha, I think we're going to open it up for questions. Councilwoman? Thank you so much. Um, I know we've been, we're trying to do good on time. I just wanted to add one thing to Ursula's um, experience that we discussed was she, they actually were successful in getting air monitors installed in buildings inside, first floor, second floor, outside. And what some of the data showed was sometimes that the concentration of ethylene oxide inside the building was higher than what was outside. So that's a fact that they collected, a data that they collected. We want that same kind of data. The emissions that were coming from the chemical plant sterogenics were, were a lot lower, Trisha, I believe you have the number, uh, than the emissions that we're dealing with in our community. So um, we do need for everybody to join in and we will be taking questions. I know we have Chief Hurd, Dr. Um, um, Ever, anybody else who, who was supposed to come up here for the panel, can you all please come up here right now, Rich, Dr. Chamberlain? And I don't know if we have anyone else, but up. Uh, oh, and, and Ursula and Dr. Terrell are still on the call uh, if you all had any questions, but I'm gonna turn it over to Trisha. Would you like to regulate the Q&A? Sure. All right, I hope some of y'all had a chance to write down some questions on your cards. Um, please feel free. This is the time to learn, ask questions. We have Dr. Terrell and Ursula and Joanna on the call. So if you have a question, if you would uh, please come up to the mic here in the middle um, to ask your questions. Um, Edna is going to keep track so that we have as many people that can ask. We ask that you limit it to one question, please. And uh, just make your point so that we can move this and more people in the community can, can speak and ask their question. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Tanya Benavides. I'm a district a resident in District 4, city, uh, city Council District 4. I'm a congressional candidate for the Democratic Party. And my question is regarding, um, well first of all, I wanna point out the irony in the fact that Laredo is one of the most medically underserved communities, especially in the state of Texas. And the fact that we are being treated basically as a dumping ground for sterilizing medical devices, I think that irony shouldn't be lost on us, and it's very concerning. We need to um, let it be known that Laredo can't be a sacrifice zone to serve the rest of the country when we ourselves are failing our own residents 
um, due to being so medically underserved. But I would like to know, um, especially from the folks that are joining us via Zoom and that have shared your story about how you have dealt with, in, with this in your community, what preventative measures can we take, especially knowing that Laredo is medically underserved and highly uninsured? Um, and maybe this is also a question for Dr. Trevino, if you have any ideas as to how can we start to prepare for um, the years to come, right? When we know that our residents are likely to be ill and that we are um, unequipped perhaps to, to treat them locally. Tanya, do you want to direct that to Dr. Trevino or Ursula? Or um, sorry, I was looking right at Dr. Trevino. Dr. Trevino, Trevino? okay. Yes, yeah, so this is a very important concern and question and we have uh, talked about this at City Council. Uh, there are many factors why we're medically underserved. Uh, a lot of things are very difficult to overcome, but it has to be done. And one of the main, main reasons is uh, our, our culture, our, our language, and uh, the temperature also. So there's a lot of things here, but uh, we can overcome those. And uh, these are uh, things that have to be directed in a task committee, which uh, City Council has, has initiated to form a task a task group to find out what we can do and uh, maybe employ a, a group of uh, persons that are, can uh, direct this, this problem. But uh, there are a lot of things we, we should do. We, we have to also start with the uh, local hospitals, the private entities that can hire some more. And uh, there was a, a question posed whether or not we could uh, build more hospitals, but the, the main thing that we need is more providers. And we saw this during the, the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, where we had to import uh, uh, providers, nurses and technicians and even doctors to uh, help the hospital because there were not enough of us. So all these things uh, can uh, be continued to be directed and that's, that's a first step to do it. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Dan Maldonado. I am a, live in District 7 for the past 26 years. Uh, Councilman Perez, thank you. Councilwoman, thank you. Panel, thank you so much. Um, my question is micron size. What size is the micron of the oxide? Does it get smaller as it travels? And will these masks help? So would that question be for Dr. Terrell? Did you hear the question, Dr. Terrell? I, I think the if I heard it correctly, the question was how big is a micron or a microgram? Yeah, does it get smaller as it travels? And as I can see from the map, um, it's only red on the United States side. I know it's traveling to Mexico. Is it contaminating our water also? So, so yeah. that, sorry, Dr. Terrell, so there were just a few questions. One about the micron and what happens to it as it travels. Are face masks uh, helping? Now. helping? and uh, also the issue of ethylene oxide in water. So face masks definitely are not helping. Um, ethylene oxide is a very, very small molecule and it can, it, it can penetrate into packaging for medical equipment, right? So that's, that's one reason they use it. So imagine, you know, if they can go through, right through a paper, a sealed paper container to sterilize something, it can go right through, you know, your mask into your lungs. Um, I, I don't know the answer to the question uh, on ethylene oxide contaminating water, but I'm happy to, to look more into that and send you whatever resources I can find. Um, and then, oh, the third question, you know, what's a, what's a micron? Uh, so, so ethylene oxide is, is, the concentration is measured in units of micrograms per cubic meter, which is really hard for, to, to visualize, right? Um, you know, uh, a, a microgram is one millionth of a gram, which is a small amount to begin with. Um, and then a, a cubic meter is, you know, a meter by a meter by a meter. So it's, you know, suffice it to say, it's a teeny, teeny, teeny amount, you know, in, in a volume that you could see. Um, and it, 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 it doesn't, the, the concentration gets lower the farther from the source, which I think was the question yeah. you were getting at. Okay. Um, and that's why, you know, as you get farther away from the source on the map, the risk gets lower. Uh, and the map is created based on the Environmental Protection Agency's data. 
And because it's a federal agency of the United States government, they don't estimate risk for Mexico. Yep. So that's right. why that on that map, it, it's such a hard line at the Mexican border. But your your intuition is absolutely right. You know, Ethylene Oxide doesn't need a passport to cross the border. It's not waiting at the border. It's affecting people, you know, in on, on the other side uh, just as much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, uh, her question was just very quick. She was saying since uh, ethylene oxide is colorless and odorless, has the city considered putting restrictions on when it can emit? Uh, and then she also talked about how many Laredo workers work in warehouses that are concentrated in this area, and these warehouses have. Uh, you know, the, the, the doors or gates open and, and, and this air is, is circulating. So I'm not sure who would want to take that question about um, the city, if the city is considering something like that. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm Marta Martinez, city council member for District 6. Uh, District 6 is part of the north, um, so I'm very concerned about this as well. You know, currently we're looking at every option to figure out what we can do. But when we look at it just from an objective perspective, right now um, this company is working under what TCUQ allows them to do, right? So their regulatory agency is okay with what they're currently doing. And ultimately they're the ones that are responsible for regulating this company. And so any restrictions that we try to put on them right now would not be possible because TCEQ trumps what the city of Laredo can do, which is why it takes a community to try to raise awareness and try to change that. Because currently, as it stands, we're hampered. We're very hampered by what we can do. Um, if we change the hours of operation, we can open ourselves up to lawsuits. Um, and ultimately, regulatory-wise, we won't be able to do it because they're within their limits of what they're allowed. There's conflicting evidence between what the EPA allows and what TCEQ uh, allows. We're gonna, we're gonna say that we're gonna go with the safest uh, outcome for our, our, our constituents, so we're gonna side with EPA until we're proven otherwise. And so that's why we're here as a community trying to figure out how do we build support to try to raise awareness so that the elected leaders above us, those that are on the state level, on the federal level, can hear us loudly. That's all I can say for now, Matt. Eh, disculpen, eh, han considerado eh, 
que todo esto impactará la economía de, del precio de las casas del norte de Laredo? Yeah, so uh, again, we're looking at that as well because ultimately I, I think people will want to um, you know, keep their home safe. People are, are wanting to live in, a, in an area that's safe. I think up until about a year ago, we really didn't know this was happening, right? And we would anticipate that at least the company, which has uh, that did come to council, was it Monday? Came to council Monday. They agreed with us that the safety and the health of the constituents is the most important thing. So they are willing to put these testers. And so I think hopefully, if we can get this testing equipment up quickly and if the EPA can come in quickly, so we can start assessing the situation with actual data, not mathematical models, but actual data, then hopefully we'll eliminate the need for, for the fear uh, of people leaving this area because we don't want that. We want everybody to feel safe in their homes. Uh, and so, but we need to move quickly and, and efficiently. We, we can't waste any time. And so that's why uh, Council Member Pettis brought this item to council and we were able to get the company to agree to put this equipment in. Um, and now we as a group, we, we have to make sure that, that we get that equipment and we get the EPA to respond to our needs um, uh, very quickly. That, that's what we're hoping for. Muchas gracias. And I, I think the reason why this coalition exists is because, uh, just because they are, um, you know, uh, abiding by their permit and so it's not illegal, it doesn't make what the poisoning of our air any safer or okay and we're not okay with that and that's why this coalition is here and that's why you're here tonight too and we need to change that and you saw what happened in outside of Chicago when a group of people got together with a plant that was producing far far less than what Laredo does and how they were able to change that and they were able to get their state legislators to change the laws as well so people power um, can make things happen. So we need to know that and recognize our power here uh, and what can, can go forward from here as well. Uh, my name is Valentin Reese for the record. I'm a veteran. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate my community for being here. Um, hats off to you guys. Okay. You have a First Amendment right to speak up, okay? A First Amendment right. Whether you're here legally or illegally, you have a right, okay? And by me telling you this is me telling you bring your children, okay? Your 12-year-olds, your 16-year-olds, your kids that are going to graduate because they're going to vote. And look who's here, Marte, Vanessa, Miss Alisa, and Mr. Lupio Gomez. What about the rest of the people? Because this involves our whole community. It poisons our land, our air, our water. And cancer does not hit us overnight. It'll slowly grow in us and be transferred to our children, generations to generations. So wake up and be mad because they're poisoning our community, our people, our raza, okay? They think because we're Mexicans or Indians or Native Americans, that we don't have a voice, but we do. They think that we don't know how to read or write or write Alisa's name. But guess what? We wrote her name and we got her in there. Okay? So rise up, my people. Rise up. Hi, good evening. My name is Isabella. I'm a student at TAMIU, and I just have a few questions to clarify because after watching this, I'm just left with a few questions. So I know, um, thank you for joining us, Ms. Joanna and um, Ursula. The plant that opened up in Chicago was opened up in 2018, and you saw a direct result of the ethanol oxide. But to my understanding, Midwest has been here since 2005, correct? Do we know how long it takes to develop cancer as a result of EO in intoxication? Because why now, I guess that's my question. If they've been here for 16 years, they saw a direct result and it's been two years. So why now for us? It's been 16. So Dr. Terrell, are you able to answer that? She's asking about, you know, how long does it take uh, exposure to ethylene oxide uh, to lead to potential cancers? Um, and also I think, um, uh, Ursula, the plant in Willowbrook opened in what year? 1984. It was 1984. They were open for about 34 years. 
34 years before. Okay, so Dr. Terrell, are you able to answer that question about exposure? Yeah, um, so research has definitely shown that it varies based on the type of cancer. Um, there's a, kind of a, a review article that I usually reference, and they put kind of the average time frame at 16 years for breast cancer. Uh, but of course, it can be shorter and longer, right? And, and for me, what that, um, and I'm happy to share, uh, I can send Trisha that, that review article, but the thing that it really illustrates for me is that, you know, the, the information that it presents ranges from, you know, like two years to 40 or 50 years, depending on the type of cancer that you're talking about. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that uh, could take a long time um, to develop and then to be diagnosed. Uh, and I think the reason why, or, or I know the reason why communities are just now talking about it is because EPA didn't realize how toxic ethylene oxide was initially. So in, um, in I think, 2006, it started you know, looking at the updated science and doing an updated risk assessment, and it didn't finish that process until 2016. So in 2016, EPA updated all of its information, um, and then in 2018, published the results of its air toxics, uh, its national air toxics assessment. And so when it published that in 2018, all of a sudden communities had maps like the ones that you all have in front of you tonight. And so it became very, very clear to people that, you know, wow, I'm, I'm in an area that has a, a very, very high risk uh, compared to the rest of the country. Um, so it's, it's been a problem for a long time but the science and the understanding and the communication have only just now started to catch up. And I think Dr. Trevino was gonna speak to that too. Yes, uh, another thing that we need to be aware of is that uh, we need to base ourselves on data, not on models. These are models and uh, these are maps and these are just uh, statistics, but we need data. And the data can be obtained from uh, whatever proposal we said a while ago. But uh, we have to also understand that the cancers are, are multifactorial. It, there's no, not one individual cause. So uh, when we get the data, we'll be able to decipher what, what is what. So uh, again, I do strive on getting the data. And then uh, Dr. Marte, and then Dr. Terrell or Ursula, after Dr. Marte, if, if, if y'all want to jump in and, and close out the answers, feel free. Yeah, so what Dr. Trevino is referencing is really important. Uh, as a medical professional, we have to know what risk is, right? And so we manage risks, but we also treat the actual outcome, the actual cancer, if you will. Right now in the city of Laredo, we are not seeing a high uh, rate of cancer, these cancers that are associated with this. It doesn't necessarily mean that it won't happen a few years from now. We're trying to mitigate the risks. But as we see it right now, we're actually not seeing that. And so um, we have been breathing this in for some years. Uh, but, uh, but we don't recognize so far the uptick of cases that we would be concerned about. That's not to say that we don't have a risk. For instance, um, does anybody know your lifetime risk of getting in a car accident and actually meeting your demise? One in 107, right? And so that's a risk, that's a real risk. And so this risk is about five times that, right? And so we have to be cognizant that we're dealing with risks, but we're going to treat the cases when they come. We are medically underserved, and so we have to be even more concerned about this. Because if, if we don't have the resources, the hospitals, the doctors, uh, the specialists, the oncologists, I think we only have two, we don't really have any capacity to treat people. And so we have to be concerned about this, but, but ultimately just so that we don't, you know, we, we should be passionate about this, but we also don't want to spread fear. There is no active increase in cancer right now. There's an increased risk, but we're not seeing the cancers yet. So, you know, you don't have to run home to your doctors and check to see if you have cancer right now. Probably not, okay? But that doesn't mean that we're not monitoring the risk and we're not taking this uh, as an important problem, because it is. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Ursula or Dr. Terrell, any comments you'd like to just close with there? Yeah, I wanted to jump in a little bit and talk about um, a cancer study that our state did. Um, they often do studies based on zip codes, 
but since our uh, our area is densely populated, we span a couple of zip codes, and we the plant is located in between a couple of major zip codes that span larger geographic areas. So they went in and created a geographic area for us and did a specific study that took them about nine months um, tracking the cancers starting about 10 or 15 years after our plant opened because they needed that much lead time to start to see the cancer results come out that might be significant. And it happened around that time. Uh, there were like market increases and um, in certain cancers. They used a comparison group um, for our area that encompassed um, the collar counties of Chicago. So there were, I believe, five counties in, uh, in that to make a comparison population. Um, our cancer rates were elevated even though our comparison population included two counties with three known equinoxide sources. So the, the cancer rates are not there yet, but you've only had, what, 15 years of exposure. Um, so this is right about the time when, if our study is similar to yours, those cancer rates that you're seeing in people would start to show up. Um, it's, it, it takes a little while, like the, like the physician said, between exposure and the symptoms coming out enough for somebody to seek treatment. Um, and you also want to make sure that when you're looking at cancers, you're looking at the rates of cancer diagnosis, not just the deaths. We've gotten much better at surviving some of these cancers. So if you're only looking at deaths, and some of those studies do, you're going to miss all the cancers that actually happen. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you, Ursula. Um, Dr. Terrell, were you going to say something, or or no? Yeah, I I also want to add that um, you know I work with a lot of communities in rural areas where it's a very small population, you know, exposed to a, a toxic pollutant, and the smaller the population, the harder it is to find that evidence of health impacts. Think about it, you know, if you go home and you talk to your neighbors on your block and you say, okay, I want to see if there's a correlation between smoking cigarettes and, and getting lung cancer, so I'm going to survey everybody on my block. Well, you're probably not going to find that correlation, right? Because, because of random chance, because of all the other things that influence cancer. So that's why we rely on bigger studies, on nationwide studies. Um, on, on region-wide studies, on global studies, to understand if something causes cancer or not. And then once we've established that it causes it, the question becomes, are people exposed to it? So if it were me and my community, my main question right now would be, how much ethylene oxide am I exposed to? Um, not, not is there a problem from ethylene oxide, because we know that from other research, but how much ethylene oxide am I breathing in, uh, and, and how does that compare to, um, to what EPA says is a safe level? All right, uh, thank you. And I did want to add one more thing to your, to your question. Uh, being that we do live in a medically underserved community that is right on the border with Nuevo Laredo, we have to also take into consideration that the data we may have may be skewed because some people who may end up being diagnosed with cancer may be crossing to get their medical treatment because they can't afford it or whatever the reasons are that they prefer to go across the border uh, and, and seek treatment over there. So that's something else to take into consideration when, when we're looking at these numbers and if these numbers come out and, and are made available. So we have a, if, if you don't mind, so we could try to get one person for a question, but if you can get on the line and we'll, we'll take your next one. Yeah, Thank no, you. that was it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Selena Vallarta. I'm with District 6. I'm a resident there. Um, if Midwest has known about the dangers and that it's a carcinogenic, did they have any type of legal obligation to notify the city, the public, government, school districts? Is there anybody who wants to take that question? Uh, so essentially, no, uh, because and their
still falling under the guidelines uh, or, or the, the regulatory agency and they're following the rules of the regulatory agency, they are not um, uh, responsible. I, I think it's up to our federal government to let us know of these dangers, right? And so now we're seeing that the EPA is um, coming um, to our area and starting to spread the word of the dangers of this substance, this compound. But before that, it really, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be a company very long if you were raising awareness of the potential toxicity of what you are producing, right? And so they ha are not under any regulatory um, uh, requirement to, to, to let us know. I think we wouldn't have known about this either uh, had it not been for uh, an investigation uh, uh, journalistically that occurred that um, brought this all to light. Uh, and so that, that's, the, that's the answer to that is no, they're not. It's up to the EPA and the EPA is finally getting around to letting us know, you know, 20 years later. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Guillermo Castro Jr. I live in district, I live in district uh, seven and uh, I've been here for almost uh, for all of my life. Uh, in 1989, we had a scare uh, chemical uh, was released in the air. And that middle of the night, the city went and got all these people out, took them to the Civic Center, and where that fume blew all along that area, trees were burned, uh, roofs were, were, were singed, you know. We live in a dangerous district, and I think it's the city's obligation to protect us. You failed us then, and you're failing us today. I compliment you by, by being here tonight. Do we have a code enforcement? And are they existent or are they non-existent? I invite you to take a bus drive, city councilmen and women, to drive by these uh, industrial parks, and you'll see every violation that is out there. I can't blame these people for coming here and then trying to invest and bring jobs but we must be thinking that not just of the ad valorem uh, money that they've come in and they bring. We must be thinking of the safety. You know, we, we don't know what comes across. Dangerous goods and stuff. You heard about these places where they were wiped out, where, where explosion or a leak was done. How do we answer to that? Tricia, you did an environment test on the school, on uh, diesel. We have an elementary school where the city again failed us. They allowed trucking to come into this area. The district failed us or the city failed us. Bottom line, it comes to your hands and I'm sorry to throw it at you, but who do we blame? Can't blame them for coming here. Our job is to create jobs and find employment, but at what price? Not too long ago and I'm not blaming them, I think uh, Mueller had a, a young, young man that had cancer and they made him a, a hero's parade and stuff like that. Are we gonna have that from now on? Because we're too eager to make the buck, not to think the safety of our, our children. You know, our time, and I'm thinking of my grandkids, a future for them, a tomorrow for them. You know, it's in your hands, people. I invite you to take that trip invest in a bus and see the industrial parks, who that comes in here. And let's get some people in the code enforcement because it's not existent. And I can take you tomorrow. A blind person can see there's a lot of violation, but we turn the other way. Why? It goes back to the old city policy. Lo mio, donde esta lo mio? Thank you. materials permits where we monitor uh, the storage and and so we do we do have that system and we do visit all of the permit holders at least four times a year sure. um, hi my name is Virginia Palacios and I'm an environmental science and policy professional here in Laredo um, I just wanted to I guess announce that uh, the TCEQ is under a process with the state legislature right now called the sunset review process 
It's something that every state agency has to go through every six to 12 years. And so the legislature is gonna be taking a really close look at how the TCEQ does its job, how well it does its job. And now is a really good time for the public to be making comments to the TCEQ and to the legislature so that in 2023, the legislature can change laws and require the TCEQ to do a better job. I was really disturbed to hear that TCEQ is not using the same modeling data that EPA is. Typically when EPA changes its rules, then TCEQ has to enforce the rules that come down federally. Um, and so it's really important that we have a TCEQ that cares more about human health than business's bottom line. And I think we need to make that very clear to the TCEQ. And I hope that everybody in this room is gonna submit some comments to the TCEQ, hopefully with the help of the Laredo Clean Air Coalition. Thank you, Virginia. And just a reminder, please uh, join the coalition, sign the petition to the EPA and so that you can stay in touch and become a part of this as well. We, we really encourage you all. So, the, hi, I'm Edna. I'm part of the coalition. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Hi. Uh, this is not a question. I just wanted to share because it, it really did hurt. You know, the, res, uh, the Perry data came out my son, who's 11, he's in fifth grade, came out from school and started asking questions. Incorrect information, of course he had. Me thinking that it was gonna be so much easier to explain to him that yes, the school, that no, the schools are not putting gas, that it's gonna put them to sleep in their air. That uh, the air that they're breathing will give them cancer. I thought I was helping him. He had an anxiety attack. He, he started telling me, mom, why? Why? Right after COVID? Really? What's going on? He had an anxiety attack and I'm trying to calm him down and tell him, that it's gonna be okay. And clearly the data shows that it's not if ETO is still in our air. How do you explain that to your kids? How do you accept that? How do you say, okay, let them breathe something that I know, that the EPA knows, that everyone knows that causes cancer? Would you want that for your kids? I certainly don't. You know what I told them? I said, you know what, baby? Right now, I can't give you the answer, but I know that we are fighting this. And that's what I am doing. I'm fighting. And I'm here to tell you that we need to join forces because no kid should ever, ever be told with every breath you're taking, you're breathing in cancer just a little bit at a time. He's been, he's 11. So he's been breathing ETO for 11 years. You tell me that's right. I don't care what the TCEQ says. I really don't care what the EPA says. Explain that to your kids. Go out there to the school and tell them, you're breathing something that may cause cancer. Kids are aware, especially through a pandemic. I think we really, really, as a city, and you guys as our council people really need to do something about this. Thank you. Good evening, thank you very much. My name is Cynthia Gallardo, community member and also part of Risks Advisory Board. Thank you very much for bringing awareness to this community and also to um, our presenters as well from out of town. I do have um, a two questions. My first question is, if protective measures are taken towards the reduction and elimination of these facilities or ethylene oxide in our community, what is the estimated time that it will take to improve our air quality? Would that be you, Dr. Terrell, or Ursula? Well, I, I can speak to it, and Ursula has a graph uh, to it, right? So the, the answer is immediate. Uh, the thing is that ethylene oxide is not one of these chemicals that sticks around in the environment for a very long time. 
Um, and Ursula showed a really compelling graph that had you know, very high spikes in ethylene oxide. And then when sterogenics was shut down, the monitoring data showed all of that go to zero. Um, so I think you know, the, the proof is, has already been demonstrated what an impact uh, that can have and how quickly it can happen. Yeah, what we saw was as soon as our canisters were sealed in February, the, we were collecting data the entire time um, from months before until something like six weeks or eight weeks after, and the drop was pretty immediate. It went down to um, what the companies had always claimed were causing all the spikes in data to just um, was blowing around over the whole world. Um, so there were, it was like night and day. I do have another question. Um, th for individuals that have pre-existing conditions, perhaps such as uh, asthma or lung cancer, what is the rate of effect of ETA, uh, ATO, as compared to those individuals that don't uh, have these pre-existing conditions? Is that Dr. Terrell? Would that be you or, or Ursula? Well, I'll share from my or, perspective. Or, um, so it's, there's a lot that we don't know about, um, about other risk factors that, that interact with uh, ethylene oxide exposure. But we know that in general, pollution is a risk factor for respiratory disease um, and, and for other types of diseases. Um, so I think, you know, in general, uh, if, if it's a sensitive population, if it's people who have pre-existing conditions, then that's all the more reason to be concerned. Um, and in the absence of data and in the absence of, of hard information, if it were my community, I would want to err on the side of, of protecting people. Okay, and I think Dr. Trevino was going to speak to that. Yeah, a, uh, any underlying condition with a, a uh, substance or anything that's uh, detrimental to your condition will exacerbate it. Just like asthmatics, if they're in a uh, environment where there's a lot of dust or smoke, they'll have an asthmatic attack. People who have underlying conditions like uh, respiratory uh, illnesses, COPD, emphysema, or cardiac conditions, if you add another uh, substance or any other uh, condition that will exacerbate uh, their illness, it is, it is important. So. Anything that will, will make the illness worse is, is worth mentioning. It is, it is there. Thank you so much. And I think we have a couple of questions left. And I know we have an overflow room, and they had a long delay. And uh, you know, we'll just check very quickly if they might have any questions. But um, go ahead. Hello. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, And, I'm, and I was concerned. So in April uh, the 4th, 2019, Loretta Mor uh, Morning Times issued an article that states, or that is titled, La Bota Ranch Residents Voice Complaints of Unsafe Environment Along Mines Road. So this was in 2019. Why did we wait two and a half years to address this issue? Why, why now? Okay, uh, that was probably something I was involved in. Uh, back then, we were concerned about the diesel emissions and through working similar to how we're working now, we were able to work with risk and come up with a program to help the uh, commercial industry switch to electrification, get some grants so that they can, you know, that, that's a separate issue. Back then, we weren't talking about ethylene oxide. It was more diesel. But yes, we do have diesel in the air as well, right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. So um, that was also regarding Muller Elementary. They were gonna put a warehouse in front, which is still an active threat. And they were gonna park um, refrigerated trailers right next to the school, uh, outside of the proper zoning that we're gonna be running while the kids were gonna be at school and we were able to stop that. Okay, um, one more thing. And I've noticed we're getting a lot of beat around the bush kind of uh, responses. When are, we, when are we going to get legit responses? Where, um, you know, when will that start? When will we start seeing some sort of change? Um, you know, 
Oh, as I as I listen to the story of, um, uh, tell me your name again, Edna, uh, talking to her child and not be able to give um, a real firm answer. Uh, that's kind of how we feel, uh, because we are just figuring out this information as you are figuring out. And what we're trying to do is to relay every ounce of information that we're getting directly to you. Uh, and so there's nothing that we're hiding. Uh, we're, we're really out in the open. And the reason why we're saying that is because as soon as we found out what was happening, we took initiative. And that's why this meeting is happening. And so if we had firm answers to give you, we would give them to you. Um, but we don't because we're still looking for information. And we know that ethylene oxide is a carcinogen. We also know that there are regulations that currently hamper our ability to do something. So we have to have swift action to ensure that, that we can get past that hurdle uh, and make the, the community safer. And so I feel uh, for Edna because I feel the same way in front of all of you today, trying to tell you that we know that there's a situation here. I mean, you can see us here standing in front of you being accountable. Um, and, and hopefully, as soon as we have more information, we're going to pass it down to you the exact same way as we're giving you what we know currently. for the reason of I had a thyroid cancer. And since I moved here, I ended up getting cancer again. And throat, throat cancer, which I am a survivor twice for it. And my daughter goes here to Washington Middle. And ever since we moved here, I noticed that she was starting to get like very, uh, um, lots of headaches. She gets headaches, she gets fatigue, she gets body aches. She forgets a lot of things. And I was Googling what is that, it, like what it causes, and that's what my daughter has ever since we moved from Indiana to here to the Laredo. So now I'm seeing that the, what you guys know about the kids being in danger, being in school that could get these type of symptoms or illnesses, are you guys thinking about like removing these children out of these schools because this could affect our kids? And, in medical wise, and because me as a history, as a, I'm a you know cancer survivor, and she, my daughter is half black, and half black people, black people, have more danger of getting breast cancer, and she's a female, she's a my she's a girl, so like does she have a more risk of getting cancer as well? Because I'm a cancer survivor twice. My family runs through cancer, so now this kind of like gives me a scare for my children. Because I, since I found out they do not not go to school, for, like are you guys are giving options like homeschooling or like monitoring through the system how you guys were last year? Because this is something that I'm concerned more about the kids than anything because kids are more immune to it than us adults. And I just wanted to see if this is why, is, like are you guys, I know you guys talked about doing the blood work and stuff like that for our kids, but how fast are you guys gonna do that? Because these are, these are our kids are going to school again tomorrow and they're gonna keep on smelling their thing. It could just make them worse by each day that they go to the school. So this is like something serious for me as for my kids, because I'm concerned about my kids. As she said about her, her son having a panic attack. So it's my kids. My kids are very scared to even go to the school. You know, These are things that I feel, I believe that you guys should go to the school and speak to the kids to calm them down because kids are smarter than we think. The kids see and they're like sponges. They observe everything we say, they see, whatever. So I feel like me as a parent, I would like if you guys could go and explain to the children what's really going on so they don't feel lost and confused because they come to us with questions that we don't know just like you guys don't know. So. I feel like for clarity, for them to have peace of mind as kids, not to have worries, because they already have stress enough by seeing us stressing. So I just feel like it's best for the kids to know exactly what's going on so they don't be up in the air like confused. We will, we will reach out to the We will reach out to our partners at UISD. I'll make that commitment myself. I won't speak for it, but I'm sure you guys will as well. And uh, we'll reach out, and we already have done that um, previously, mm -hmm. um, but we will make another attempt as well to talk to them okay. uh, about what their um, what kids are feeling right now. Um, this is eye-opening to us as well. We didn't realize that there were so many 
children that were being exposed to this material right. and are fearful and having panic attacks. And so, uh, and you're right, sometimes we, we forget that our, our, our little loved ones are, are much more intelligent than we anticipate, mm -hmm. right? And they're hearing all this and reading all this through social media. Okay. And so I, I, will, I will reach out to UISD, to the people I know as well, and I think you guys can speak to what's already been done uh, in, this, uh, in this field. We, we did uh, meet with the superintendent of UISD and uh, some other folks, so they are committed to wanting to help figure this out and try to end uh, the, these emissions of ethylene oxide in our air. We're gonna have a meeting with EPA on Monday, uh, and so you know it's important to know that it's not just specific to the schools, it's, it's, it's so widespread right. and uh, and so, so this is the, one of the reasons why uh, you know, we need to bring down these emissions overall, uh, because it's not just specific to, to a school and that's it. It's, it's the neighborhoods and the greater area. But, but Daniel, you were gonna say something. Yes, I, well, I just wanted to um, restate, you know, we have spoken to United uh, UISD and, and that is their position thus far. I don't wanna speak on their behalf, but from what they've told us, they're committed to this. They're committed to getting ethylene oxide out of the air for, for the students. I did also want to clarify it is, uh, I know you had uh, made like some suggestions like homeschooling and stuff, but again, the dangers and the risk could also be at your home. You know, I don't want to scare anybody, but it's just the truth of the matter. Right. Finally, I, and I think that's why everybody should, you know, use the QR code, go to our website, become a volunteer, uh, sign our petition, call your council members uh, so that we can we can try to, to put some pressure and, and, and fat, you know, obviously thank you all for being here, but for the ones who aren't. And, and so the, that way we can try to implement this, this blood uh, testing. So the concerns that you have right now with the fatigue, the loss of memory, the, the headaches, right. you know, maybe you, you could see what the results are if you volunteer your child to that. So, so say like if my daughter is exposed to that and she didn't get affected by that, then what? Is that a loss of for me for Laredo? Or is that also for who? Because obviously this has been going on since 2005. I've been here for three, I've been moved from Indiana to here like three, four and four years ago. And ever since I moved here, my, that's when my daughter started feeling sick. She was never like that. And I even took her to doctors. She goes to the schools constantly to the nurse, complaining about headaches. You know, like what is the process after that if our kids are exposed to this and we just barely finding out? I think that would be something for you. Your concerns are very, uh, very well taken, and I have empathy for that because I am here also a resident here. But we have to also think, as, as we have been saying, that we need the data in order to correlate. Uh, the fear is there, and your concerns are there, but the purpose of these meetings are to establish the steps that need to be taken. And they have been identified to, to get some monitors, to get some uh, biological markers. And with that data, then uh, you can proceed. Because the fear is there, I understand your fear, but let's not make any premature conclusions until we have the data. But, but your concerns are well taken, and I empathize with that. So it's okay for our children to keep going to school? Or to, to keep them at home? Let's get the data as soon as possible. You know, there's a lot of things that are ri that are risky to do, uh, but we still do them. But we have to understand that we have to ha have a correlation to the causation. Because it's a risk does not mean that the cause is there. But you have to get those two things together. But I, I understand that these things have to be done, and uh, this is relatively urgent to start thinking about how to do it. A direct answer to your question comes from TCEQ, uh, the regulatory agency for this, and they said, yes, it is safe. They directly told us that. Okay. We, in some way, disagree because there's conflicting data, and so right. we disagree. Um, but the regulatory agency said, yes, it is safe. We're just trying to go a step beyond that to make sure it's the safest that it can possibly be in Laredo, Texas, and we don't feel that we're there yet. And so I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you anything more other than, than what the regulatory agency has said so far. Okay, and so say like, you know, like, is it important in the school? Is it the same way as in our, inside our homes, or is it more inside the school? No, it's, 
it's just widespread. It's, it's widespread. Mm -hmm. like it, no matter if yes. it's a school or in a home, it's right. still being affected. The same yes, way. and that's why uh, we're trying to get the air monitoring up as soon as possible so we really see actual data. So okay. I think it's, thank I know you. it's already, thank you so much. I, I know it's 8.30, and, uh, but we have four more questions. And again, let's just uh, keep it to one question and just if you want to direct it to a particular person. Thank you. Well, and I just want to add, uh, this is town hall number one. We, we are not finished with this topic. This is something we're going to be working on. So again, we do need for you to join with us, and we will be holding more town halls. But if we can answer your questions t tonight, we're going to try like we have been doing. I'm Mary Perez, District 5, and I want to know if we have a game plan, and if we do, if you any of you can provide us with bullet statements, bullet points, to let us know what the game plan is to tackle the, this very horrible, urgent, and pressing issue. And um, if you don't, if you could please provide one to us uh, as soon as possible. And then for either of the two doctors, somebody asked the question about prevention. If you all know about any type of prevention we can take from now on that we know. And the question was not answered. Can either one of you or both of you answer, please? Oh, oh Dr. Richard Chimley with the Health Department. So just to give you bullet points on the game plan that we had discussed as a group when we did meet, or we have been meeting on this topic, is of course first and foremost to get um, TCEQ to provide us with those air monitoring systems at, at the facility and of course around the city of Laredo so that we are able to acquire that data to demonstrate, of course, the level of toxicity in our air. Aside from that is then moving forward into the, the biomarkers um, and putting that into place and finding sources of funding to ensure that that is going to occur. And then of course, working with independent agencies that are not government affiliated to ensure that this is not the EPA and the TCEQ telling us what they are telling us, but we also want somebody who's right in the middle, who's impartial to the information that is being provided to us. So that then in turn will be able to provide us the fuel that we need to be able to demonstrate that this does not need to be in our community. And then I'll hand it over to one of the doctors on the following questions. Yes, definitely. And in order to, uh, to have a game plan, we have to start again with data. So this is important and to start with this uh, point number one is the data so we can proceed after that. So preventive, preventive measures, we don't have any at this time. At this point, uh, the only thing that uh, is, is being identified is the risk. So uh, any, any real prevention measure, the ethylene oxide, I understand, is, is, is uh, odorless, colorless, and it can be in any place, and it can penetrate uh, so uh, none. surfaces. So Thank we'll you. work on that. Unfortunately, the building director is not here with us today. Uh, really, my question was directed for uh, that person as far as zoning is concerned. Is it an M1? Is it an M2? Is it a special use zone, et cetera? Back then, what were the requirements versus today? Stick with your zoning director, please. So we will reach out to our planning and zoning director, and we will, we will get that information for you. From their side, that were, are, may, might not be legal as of. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I do research. think that they're an M1. If uh, they have to be an M1. If it's an M1, maybe might not be a compatible a and operation. Okay. So please dig into your M1 and two and especially use the guidance. The year, also the year that they uh, asked for the permit, and when this particular operation, uh, like I said, particular. Well, right now we have our, our land development code is outdated. No, I'm not talking about land development. I'm talking about M1. But, it, but the different. zoning is listed there, and we're actually revamping it in our recode meetings. Look at your 1990, whenever they started. Y yes. So on, on this one, uh, I'm just giving you the chance to go back to your office. We're going to look. And look, and I have his number. Get back to one of you guys. This, this company has to have a hazardous uh, materials permit. 
and they, they have to. And there's uh, a lot of, lot of limits on that. You yeah, know, you're, you're right, and we'll look at it. We'll look at it for you. As far as your type of operation, your times of operation. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Maria Salazar. I've been living in District 7 since 2015. In late 2016, my oldest son was diagnosed with the first cancer. Um, the first thing the doctors told me, it was environmental, and it was unknown. My son passed away early 2019. My question is for the doctors. In my situation, I know people that live in that area that had cancer and that had passed away. Um, what can I do to help since I, since I have medical records? How can I provide them to help in this situation that we're going through? <laughs> That's my question. And all of this makes me angry because at the beginning of his diagnosis, I had, I had no answers. And it hurt, not just him, but when, when you know a child, no matter what age, but when you know a child that's going through cancer, you think it's just your child until you know the school has 10 kids that have cancer. Childhood cancer, it's not well known. It's kept in the low. And it hurt me, not knowing just my son was fighting cancer alone, but going to the, to the walk in April, knowing that more than five kids in his high school were fighting cancer. It hurt me, and they were, all of them lived in the area. Not a lot of people know, but childhood cancer awareness, it's very, very kept in the low, not recognized, and it hurts because I already went through that, not once, not twice, but three times that he fought cancer. And I want to know, how can I help so other parents don't go through what I went through? And I just want to know what, what records I need to get because I have everything, all his treatments, all the treatments he went through. Yes, and we do feel sorry for your loss. We appreciate your sharing that story with us. And it's a very, very hurtful to pass through a situation. We understand that. Uh, uh, you were asking how to get medical records or you do have the medical records? I have them, but how can I provide them to you to, for this situation that we're going through and that I could get my neighbors because I have several neighbors that went through cancer and other people that I know that live in the area that have passed away because of cancer. I want to know, I can, I can help ask people to help me as well to provide the information, what, they, what they're going through and what their relatives went through. Well, uh, when you deal with medical records that you do want to share, you, you can certainly bring them to the health department so we can look at them and uh, we can uh, see what the diagnosis is and what what was there. So we'll, we'll be glad to help in that, in that fashion. Thank you. I just want to add on that. Thank you so much for sharing your story and we de definitely um, cannot understand the loss. Absolutely not, we cannot. Um, but in regards to data, definitely the more data that we have as we compile data that's showing the evidence that it exists within our atmosphere right now, even unfortunately right now as we're in this room, all that information can be shared. Of course, that is confidential protected health information that would have to be notarized and shared with us that it is no longer um, protected health information. Um, and then we can definitely um, house that information as custodian of records at the health department. First and foremost, I'm extremely sorry for your loss. I, I can't imagine what that is like, losing a child. And so for that, I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss. This is, uh, on behalf of the coalition, you had mentioned that you know you, you would be willing to, to help, to speak out, to reach out to neighbors. If that's what you can do, that's something else you can do to help, to, to bring these people together, to make everybody aware of this. 
Because the reason why Trisha and I and everybody else who co-founded the Clean Air Laredo Coalition, the reason why we did that was because we don't want to be like Willowbrook where 15 years from now there's thousands of stories like yours. Okay, we ha I have family here, my wife lives here, her parents live here, you know, there's children in this community and depending on who you ask, and I would only want to ask the EPA, I don't care what TCEQ has to say personally, if you ask EPA what they think, they're saying that we're, we're at risk. And for that reason is why we started this, and so I just want to say whatever capacity you can help the coalition, that's an immense amount of help, and we need it, okay? And again, sorry for your loss. I think um, Dr. Terrell or, or Ursula had, had a chat something that they'd written? Uh, this came from Ursula. Ursula, I don't know if you want to reiterate what you had typed in the chat. Uh, if not, I can uh, read it out loud to the audience. Yeah, I can say, um, Chris, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, this brings back so many memories. We, our first community meeting uh, was kind of like a therapy session for our community because everybody brought their stories just like you have. Um, a lot of us in our movement were parents for the same reason as, as you're bringing concerns and you're worried about your kids and how to explain it to them and, and what your role should be and what you need to do. Um, so this, it, we're here because we know what it's like to sit in your seats right now. Um, and we, we really want to sit in solidarity with you. Um, just thinking, um, I don't know if you saw my daughter pop in every once in a while here on screen. Um, I had two little kids that were a little bit younger uh, when we were going through this. They're right now nine and six. Um, so they were a, a little less inquisitive. Um, they kind of understood that something was going on and that um, mom was busy a lot. And we went to a lot of meetings where, you know, everybody was a little bit upset and sad. Um, but we dealt with it by coming together and sharing our stories and planning on what to do next. Um, because we weren't going to leave our home. Um, we knew that if we left, somebody else would move in. And then they would be dealing with the same thing. And our exposure, we can't erase. What we have already had, um, we've already had, it's in the past. So our goal was to basically show our kids how to stand up to a voting, um, to say, this is our home, um, and we deserve to be safe in it. Uh, so that's, that's how we decided uh, for our community that we needed to handle it. Thank you. And oh, we, um, we're, we're, and from the from the chat, I'm sorry, that's what prompted you in the first place. In um, in the first month or so, we had um, several lawyers who lived in the area and had these experiences and joined our teams. Um, they happened to know the personal injury lawyers um, from their professional perspective, and they reached out to them and asked them to come onto a panel introduce themselves to uh, the community and offer their services. They also agreed through the strong arm of one of our community members, our, our team leaders, um, to work together because she knew that there would be enough cases to keep them all busy for years. Um, and so the thing that she wanted to prevent was all the, the different legal teams from competing against one another for clients. So she presented this as you need to work together, um, share resources, and we're, we're a community here. Um, so if there's someone with those ties in Laredo who knows local contacts that are reputable, um, that will take care of people's cases, perhaps that's an avenue and, um, and one of the next meetings. Thank you, Ursula. And we now have our last question of the evening. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Guillermo Mosrutia. Eh, solamente quería preguntarles si ya sabemos cuál es el problema y quién lo emite, 
no he escuchado nada referente a que se pueda o que estén trabajando para sacar esa planta de aquí, al menos de esta área, y ponerlo, no sé, en el área de Colombia, donde prácticamente pues, está deshabitado. No sé qué esté haciendo la ciudad para poder, este, en lugar de sacar a los niños de la escuela, mover escuelas, eh, buscar eh, cosas para, para um, ver cuánto es el, los métricos del, del, del químico, ¿por qué no mejor centrarnos prácticamente a quitar el problema de raíz, que en este caso viene siendo la maquiladora que emite pues, todos estos químicos, porque digo, vemos que no se puede regular de una forma normal, ¿verdad? entonces creo que lo, lo más recomendable sería sacarlo fuera de los límites de la ciudad, no sé si, si nuestro, nuestro equipo de, de, de la ciudad esté haciendo algo al respecto, o vaya a hacer algo al respecto. Muy brevemente, uh, hablamos con Midwest en los fines de septiembre y ellos dijeron, nos dijeron de que eh, vieron si pudieron poner la planta en tal lugar o tal lugar lejos y por cualquier razón no se pudo hacer. Um, y este, eso fue la respuesta que ellos nos dieron, la compañía misma, uh, cuando les preguntamos. Um, pero sobre su pregunta de qué que está haciendo la ciudad o si la ciudad va a hacer algo para, para que ellos ponen su planta en, en otro lugar, uh, voy a dejar que la ciudad re responde, pero, pero el problema no se va a re re relucionar, res resol resolver, uh, porque si las emisiones continúan en, en ese volumen o volumen alta, seguimos con, con la misma, porque viaja largas distancias. Bueno, uh, buenas noches uh, otra vez. Uh, varias, varios puntos que se me hace que son bien importantes. Uh, número uno, sería muy difícil que una planta de muchos, muchos millones de dólares se pudiera cambiar. Nosotros como ciudad no los podemos cerrar simplemente porque no tenemos um, eh, ahorita los números que nos indiquen que en verdad esto es un problema. Sabemos que el EPA dice esto, que hay un riesgo, pero números fijos no tenemos, entonces sacarlos de la ciudad no lo podemos hacer todavía, número uno. N número dos, si los sacamos de la ciudad, o suponiendo que los sacamos de la ciudad y que se vayan a 10 millas de la ciudad, como quiera el aire vuela y, y vamos a continuar con el problema, ¿verdad? Lo más seguro que podemos hacer es monitorear para ver si en verdad existe un riesgo fijo y si ese riesgo existe en verdad, ¿Qué pueden hacer ellos que ya están tomando pasos para bajar la contaminación que se está uh, uh, saliendo ahorita para llegar a un 0%, que es lo que nosotros pedimos? A veces, ahorita están, nada más para que sepan, y es algo que nos dijeron, basado en lo que ellos nos dicen. No podemos nosotros cuantificar lo que está pasando, pero lo que ellos nos dicen es que las emisiones están reducidas 98 o 99.8% fue lo que dijeron el lunes. El problema es que nosotros no podemos verificar eso, ¿verdad? Es lo que nos están diciendo que está pasando, pero nosotros no lo podemos verificar. Queremos la habilidad de verificarlo para en verdad poder contestar si, si el riesgo uh, es sumamente alto o no. Um, pero sacarlos de la ciudad sin tener información necesaria para tomar esa decisión es, es, uh, es muy pronto para nosotros poder tomar esa decisión. Sin embargo, no crea que no estamos pensando cualquier opción que tengamos para poder limitar lo que están haciendo ahorita bajo nuestro poder, pero estamos muy limitados en lo que podemos hacer, sinceramente. Okay. Más o menos un tiempo estimado que tengan para tomar acción referente ellos, a eso. Ya tomamos acción el lunes y ellos ya dijeron que están de acuerdo con esto. Ahora el plan de ataque es que TCEQ o el EPA nos dé el equipo necesario para poder tomar, esta, tomar las medidas necesarias para, para, para cuantificar el ethylene oxide en, en el, en el um, ambiente. ¿Este equipo ya, ya dieron una fecha en específico? Que nos van no a nos han dado la fecha, eso es algo que le quería, no nos han dado la fecha, ya estamos comunicándonos con ellos, pero todavía no nos han dado la fecha necesaria para decirles, va a ser en esta semana o la próxima, o sea, no sabemos. Pero la misma compañía ya dio permiso para poder entrar y hacer estos, uh, estas investigaciones. Eso se los pedimos el lunes y en récord nos dijeron que sí. En Willowbrook, uh, Tuvieron que invertir la ciudad, allá millones de dólares también en, en el equipo, uh, con EPA haciendo 
el estudio también. Hubo dos estudios bastante grandes. Por mientras que estaban haciendo ese estudio, la gente todavía estaban, estaban luchando para eliminar esas esos emisiones y no esperar los resultados específicamente del, del equipo. Y la, lo que nos han dicho es que hay que, hay que ver esto en, en, en varios niveles. Hay, hay, que hacer, hay que tener el equipo para, para tener los datos fijos, pero también de unirnos y luchar para eliminar estas emisiones, uh, porque no sabemos qué tanto se va a tardar para que el equipo llegue y que tenemos datos entonces hay, hay, que, hay, que, hay que hacer el otro paso al mismo tiempo que es luchar para eliminar esto. Yes, sir, sir, you got my, this. My, my question yes, sir. along the same lines. Does the city have the authority to implement more strict standards locally? And do we have, we have somebody from legal, the I mean, legal th department? To me, that would be a quick answer, especially no. since uh, since the effects of eliminating the, the problem would be immediate. But if the city has the authority to limit uh, or implement new standards locally as compared to statewide. We, we can't go beyond, and, and I know well, we, we have our that, former that's city. That's my question. Yeah, we have our former city attorney here um, that I think can explain this a little bit better. Um, so we'll just let Mrs. Hale, uh, she's our former city attorney who's also, uh, um, assistant city manager for the city of Laredo, and I think she can answer this. As the former city attorney. Yes. 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 Um, just because we're preempted, unfortunately, we're preempted from doing any regulations that ex exceed the scope of the TCEQ. So they're the ones that make these type of regulations. We don't have the right to do that, so we rely on them. So that's why at this point we need to, to allow them to come in and step in and, and take the necessary so, uh, steps. It, so it's up to... TCQ to, exactly. to, to make those judgments. We're bound by that those statutes that they um, oversee. But I do want to point out that EPA does trump TCQ, and so EPA is in the process of revamping their policies on what's acceptable right now. And we have already demanded through Congressman Cuellar, um, again, when we started the meeting, I said there was a lot we didn't know and we still don't have answers to, and I meant that, and you can see that it's true, we don't, and I apologize for that. But I want everybody to know that we have been working on this for months now, um, and we didn't want to scare the community. We, 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 we didn't want you all to be fearful. We didn't want the children to be fearful, but the reality is that this is happening and this is something that we need to address, and that's what we're trying to do, and we can't do it without you. We can, but it won't be as effective. Um, but the EPA does trump TCQ, and right now they are revamping their policies to make them stricter, and they are aware of what's happening in Laredo. They have committed to come down and meet with us, and that will be the next one of the next meetings that we will have, and hope to see everybody here and with you know an entourage with you. Um, and pack the room for that meeting because they are going to set the policies that TCQ is going to have to follow uh, at least that uh, amount. Uh, they cannot be uh, more lenient uh, than what the EPA said. So right now, EPA and TCQ are not on the same page. We're city officials, but we're not, you know, state representatives. Um, So one of the things that, uh, I have to repeat it again, <laughs> um, that because uh, Midwest facility is follow, it's following the TCEQ guidelines because they're ca categorized as a small fact manufacturing company. So we as Laredoans have to uh, come up and say that we don't want that. They need to be, um, they need to be reclassi reclassified as a major source of emission, you know, um, source in, in our community. That's why they're following the TCEQ guidelines and not the EPA. I think we haven't made that clear. 
that's why there is a disparity. And that's why they're saying, oh, we're complying with TCEQ because they are literally regulated by them because of that misclassification. Even though they're the number two emitter, or they were in 2019, the number two emitter of ethylene oxide. Yeah, because of the, I, I, I honestly don't know how they classified them, but I'm guessing the uh, income or you know the size of the plant, but certainly not by emissions. And so that, that's, that's the other point is just that, that there's this whole you know, revamping that needs to happen for our protection and us to demand, you know, and have our voice in, in how these policies are written. And that's why your voice is important in this effort because it's gonna take work, just like uh, Ursula stated, you know, the community did it just, um, Ursula's just a regular citizen, right, Ursula? You're not an elected official or anything. So sh they kind of just all got together and took action. And so here, you know, you all have some, some of us on council already on board with this and we've got Congressman Cuella is already aware of the situation and committed to helping that. I don't wanna speak for him, but I know his office is here, even though he couldn't be here. Uh, and he has put pressure on the EPA for us, got us that meeting that we're gonna have. You all had that letter that was passed out. Um, so um, we don't have a lot of answers, but we have been doing a lot of work for months already. And con uh, council members, uh, representatives from the state and also your congressmen. So we, we have been trying to work on this, but now we need your help too. And, and uh, maybe Dr. Terrell, if, if you could possibly clarify something that was said right now. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but Midwest is both regulated by the EPA and the TCEQ. However, because of the certain classifications that the EPA has, the regulations that they have to abide to, since they are not classified as a major source, uh, is less stringent than if they were classified as a major source. Or if anybody else. Uh... So I'm not an attorney, I'm okay. not giving legal <laughs> advice right now. Um, but I will say that yes, uh, in general, major source facilities that are classified as major sources are subject to much stricter reporting requirements, control te uh, technology requirements. Um, I live near, right next to a strip of minor source facilities that are all in a row uh, that collectively would add up to a major source. And so that's been a source of frustration for me is that you know minor sources, even though they're called minor, don't necessarily have minor impacts, right? Um, but the way that toxic pollutants are regulated um, is, uh, is, is different from how um, kind of, uh, so, so sorry, I should say that EPA only has established like legal limits of, of what is an acceptable concentration in the air for a very small number of pollutants. Um, the way that they regulate toxic pollutants is by uh, setting the amount that the facilities are allowed to emit. Um, and that's the rule that I think you all have been working with Marvin from Earth Justice right. on, on kind of getting ready for that. And he is probably the best person to answer specific questions on, you know, EPA versus state uh, um, regulation uh, of this facility. And so Marvin is an attorney with Earth Justice that the coalition has been working with. He's based out of D.C. and essentially what they do is try to help with the legislative writing on Capitol Hill out in Washington, D.C. And so that's one of the major concerns that's going on in the talks on Capitol Hill right now is that although regulations do exist, there are different classifications for emitters. Um, there are major sources and minor sources, and major sources are much uh, more regulated than the minor sources. Midwest is classified right now, I believe, as a minor source. They are not classified as a major source. I can tell you that for a fact. The problem with that is that even though they're classified as a minor source, uh, they're still one of the biggest emitters of uh, ethylene oxide in the entire nation. Uh, and that was brought up by EPA. They're one of uh, the top 25 high priority facilities that the EPA was under order to come to our towns and, and let us know about this issue. So that is something that uh, the Earth Justice lawyers are working on uh, in Capitol Hill to get the EPA to, to reamp those regulations and and make companies like Midwest be classified as a major source to be more heavily regulated. So just something to clarify. 
Well, that was my question. He just answered that question. He was, the percentage is being really high compared with all the rest of the, the places that are producing this kind of emissions. And it's so dangerous. Yeah, and we, dangerous. we asked that. We asked that. Uh, at the council meeting, we asked exactly that. And why were we so much higher than other, because uh, they have another plant, and why our plant here was so much higher than their plant. And they said that the technology that they were developing um, was implemented in that plant first and then brought here. But why? That's what we were trying to figure out because that we, we think it should have been done here as well uh, at the same time. Um, when they developed it, they should have put it here and or they should have developed it here. That, that, that was our take as, as when I was in my line of questioning, that, that's what I was trying to figure out. Okay. Uh, I think it, it won't be no problem for us if we all get together and work with that because the only solution is just what everybody knows, let's make it move because the, we're, gonna, we're not gonna find another kind of uh, uh, solution for our, other, our health. You know, the people that's in danger, like every day we are just breathing, everybody, uh, and if in Illinois they did it, and it was a lot less, well, we cannot. So we're, we're getting started, and on Monday, sir, uh, 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 we're having a meeting with EPA. Uh, as, as Council Member uh, Vanessa said, you know, we're, we're, we're just getting started now. And so Monday, the city, and I believe UISD, and the, the, some people from the coalition We'll be meeting with EPA, the, the director of the Air Division uh, for Region 6, which is based out of Dallas. Uh, so we're going to be pressing them on, on, on these things. Yes, we're Thank all together. I know we can handle it. And we Thank, will you. Make it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And, and, sir, yes, go ahead. Thank I just have one question. Preserving the whole, the thing is very close to the schools. And they said that it can be measured in blood work, and they said you can take the, the people to get tested, volunteer, I want to know who would be paying for that. Will we be paying that out of pocket? Would the city pay for it? When would we do that, and where would we do that? So this is something that we um, would have to pass as a council um, to direct um, where those monies um, would come from. Uh, and so, you know, we can say that probably these three here would most likely try to find the funds available and, or look for grants available through the health department as well. There are federal grants and state grants. Try to ask TCEQ or the EPA or even approach the company themselves to see what they're willing to offer because um, so far the company has at least talked to us uh, and so maybe they'd be willing to pay for that as well. But if there are funds that have to be made available through the city, we as a council, so majority five, would have to allocate those funds. And so we would then have to go um, before council and ask the, the, the rest of council. Um, I don't want to speak for them, but I think that anybody that didn't get behind this initiative would, would probably not be on council very much longer. And so uh, I think that it would be something that we would look at. But that said, we would look for external sources as well because I don't think that it would be fair, and this is my take on it, that taxpayers would have to brunt, uh, bear the burden of, of, this, of this cost when really it should be, I think, the private sector that, that is responsible. Um, they should be the ones looking um, uh, to, to try to uh, get these funds available, made available to the city because it's not really our taxpayers' money that should be going to this. I mean, we, ha we pay taxes for roads and bridges and, and, and all the other things, you know, pay rates for other things as well. Um, to take our taxpayers' money that we're pooling to try to fix a problem that is caused by a third party or by a, a company, I, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, none, nonetheless, if we had to do it, we would. And I just want to add one point. Uh, I think Dr. Chamberlain can speak to this, but I think for it to be statistically significant, I think he stated that we would need about 3,000 participants, volunteers. households, volunteers, so we would have to make sure that we would get that participation from the community. And sometimes when we put out surveys and we ask for these types of things, we don't we don't necessarily get the response. And so we would, you know, we ended up with a thousand participants. It wouldn't really help us to figure out, you know, the data. So 
Uh, this is kind of why this step needs to happen first, is to see if there's an interest in the community because a parent, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a voluntary basis and we would be subjecting ourselves and our children to come and participate and that's a very personal decision that we would all have to make for ourselves and our children and if we can get the participation, then we could move forward with the um, significant um, study. No, 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 absolutely. So in order for the data to be statistically significant, as council member was mentioning right now, we do need the buy-in of the community. And, you know, just looking out right now over the course of the evening and knowing that there's overflow, we definitely see that there is buy-in from the community. And as soon as we do have more direction where funding sources are going to come from, as we have already um, reached out to the, the Office of the Assistant Administrator for EPA, the Air Quality Planning and Standards, the Atmospheric Programs, Office of Radiation and Indoor, Transportation and Air Quality. But unfortunately, as of this moment, there are no awards available in any of those organizations. So we'll continue to look for award opportunities via the Health Department, but we're also very much open to anybody in the community that knows of any other um, organizations that can make those referrals to the city of Laredo as a municipality for us to apply. But if not, we can definitely work with both of the organizations here as they are 501Cs that can acquire those types of monies, funding, award opportunities for us here to get that started. So as of now, there's nowhere that we could go and get them tested or anything like that? To know. Because I have a child that's right on the Mother Elementary. Just, just really quick, this was done before in Lake County with a similar plant. Uh, they did it with 100 tests. Uh, it was sent to the CDC and verified by the CDCs. And so um, 100 tests was enough for the University of Chicago, Illinois to do it. So they have, they have a model. Um, there's a doctor that uh, is out there that did the research. It was federally funded with 100 tests. So that's something maybe we can look at. The test costs about 50 to 150 dollars. I, I just mentioned as a statistically significant okay. figure, but definitely finding other models that are out there, as um, Mr. Trevino just mentioned right now, can be something that can be brought into the community as well. Yeah, because the closest is like a storehouse for series of toners and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. all I, but also, I mean, um, the power is in the data. So the more persons that want to participate, the even better. So 100 could be the limit, 3,000 can be a statistically, statistically significant number that we can get, you know, 4,000, 5,000 persons, who, how as many persons that want to participate is going to be better for the community to demonstrate what the actual effect is for our health. Thank you. And I think... We're expecting participation. We'll send information soon. And, and just to be clear, you know, we, we do stress, the coalition stresses that, again, you, you use this QR code, you go to our website, you sign up as a volunteer, and you do whatever you can to help. And one of the things that could po potentially help, obviously, again, there are three uh, city council members here, but there's more that aren't. Um, and so pushing them, uh, pressuring them to take this issue uh, very seriously, to appear at these town halls, that's something that the constituents, that their constituents can do and so that's something that we ask the community to do from the coalition. Cuando tengamos la información, el momento que tengamos la información, se las vamos a pasar a ustedes. El, el, el problema es que si yo le digo algo ahorita, si yo le digo que en enero, en febrero o en marzo vamos a hacer lo que sea, y, y no cumplimos con esa fecha, nos vamos a ver como que no estamos poniendo atención o, o que somos mentirosos. La verdad es que como no tenemos la información ahorita, si yo le doy a usted un, un, una fecha, 
le voy a quedar mal y no queremos hacer eso. Al momento que tengamos la información, así como en este momento que tenemos esta información, se las vamos a pasar. Y cuando ya tengamos más, más información y más datos, igual vamos a hacer otras juntas y esas juntas para, para, le vamos a dar la información nueva o le vamos a dar el calendario que, es necesario, que, que ustedes necesitan para poder entender los pasos que estamos llevando. Uh, I, I do want to make a quick point because I know that certain council members are not here and we're getting... Um, it's, it's making it seem as though they don't care. Uh, and I, and I want to make sure that that's, you guys know that that's not the case. So we're only allowed to bring a certain number of council members to a meeting, okay? Um, by state law, we can't, go, uh, we can't go past a certain amount, right? And the, the limit that they told us at the ethics is three, because when we have four, we're already close to five. And so, even though it may seem as though others are not here because they're not here in solidarity, that's not quite the case. Make sure your opinions are heard, but please understand that there is something called a walking quorum that would make us all um, liable or, or ba ba basically would be breaking the law. And so I, 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 wanna, I wanna stand up a little bit for the other people that aren't currently here because I don't want anybody to think that they don't care it's just that we have limits as to what we can do. So just, just to make everybody aware, I think that's a really important point. All right, so. Um, so with that, we, we want to conclude our first town hall. We want to thank uh, Ursula and uh, Joanna, who joined us from Willowbrook outside of Chicago. And we want to thank Dr. Kim Terrell, who joined us from New Orleans. And uh, thank all of you. You took time out of your busy lives. So many of you have children and you work. And uh, we're just so grateful that you're here. We need you to join us. We need people to help move this forward uh, and to unite everybody. And we want to thank everybody from the city, our three council members, our fire chief, our uh, environmental solid waste director, our, our health department director, our public health authority. We're very grateful uh, uh, that they were here. We have a lot of work to do, and uh, this is not going to be a sprint. Right? It's not going to be a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. And we have to, uh, but uh, Willowbrook showed us that this is possible uh, of, of what can be achieved. Um, and so thank you all so much. Council Member Vanessa, if you'd like to just say a few closing remarks. Yes, just thank you for coming again. And this is uh, anybody that is one of my constituents that wants to talk to me, I'm going to be around. But um, yes, please continue to get involved in, in the community and what we're trying to do and, and just please know that we uh, do care about this. We're taking this seriously and we're trying to get something done as quickly as we can, working with all you know, the limitations that we have across the different entities, pr 
you know, it's, 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 it's a complicated issue, but we are trying to work on this. And thank you for being here. Good night. Before they give out this permit to build in here, did they know about the situation? Nobody knew about the situation before they started building here? EPA no. didn't even know EPA how toxic it was. No one knew. For, nobody knew. Oh, so nobody knew? Nobody knew. It, it wasn't until 2016 that when they reassessed their classification of ETO that they realized it was uh, 30 times more toxic to adults and 60 times more toxic to okay. children. In say Mayor Sines loves the city. He is on top of this issue. I know he is. He's shown a lot of support and, and I'm sure he apologizes for not being able to be here. And I think he talked to Council Member Perez. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, you know, we voted unanimously at Council, you know, last time when we brought this issue and the Mayor was part of that vote in support of the coalition and, and this town hall tonight is being sponsored based on, you know, all of the council members unanimously voted in favor, including the mayor. So even though they're not here tonight, he, he's here in support. I mean, he goes to meetings. I can tell you he goes back to back to back to back, and, and, and he was probably had a busy day today, but he is behind uh, the community on this one. And, and I just wanted to say, and Dr. Terrell, if, if, um, so they've known for some time that ethylene oxide is dangerous but it was not classified as cancer causing until 2016, but there had been studies for some decades. So they knew there was a danger to it, but it was not classified as cancer causing and that changed in 2016. And, and that information got published in 2018. And so that's why we're here today. So I just wanted to clarify that, right? All right, so thank you all so much. Uh, have a good night. Uh, please join us.